To, to fall in love with, um, both visually and, and as for poetry. Um, Kel's been a printer for longer than I've been alive. I'm just going to say, I'll turn it over to Kel. He's going to read from um, The Great Wheel, his latest book. And if there's more, then it'll be a surprise. Um, thank you so much for coming tonight. This is the first time that uh, we've had a pleasure to welcome both of these fine poets here. When I went online in the early days of getting this book together and found this wonderful mandala. I was just crazy about it. I had to do this one. And so I brought it to Annie and um, she made this wonderful cover out of it. And I love it. <coughs> so the, the mandala is a version of the Great Wheel. The Great Wheel runs in so many directions, uh, which is why I settled on the title, I'm sure. Um, it's, of course, the mandala. It's, of course, the universe, uh, the vast universe, whether it's the Earth revolving or just the whole thing. But it's top spinning. It's the time of the year. Uh, it's that creature called the Uroboros, which is the, the snake that, with the tail in its mouth that, that makes the circle like that. I mean, it's in myth. It's in science. It's everywhere, the, the great circle. Oh, and it occurred to me at the end, it's in Las Vegas as well. It's the expense to make your money, right? <laughs> That's a great wheel, too. So <clears throat> the other portion of the title, Zero the Unnaming, I'm going to just say that to you and then leave you to listen because you're going to find out more about both Zero and Unnaming as we go on in this reading. Um, I consider this book a poem, and I've, I've learned this from... Uh, <laughs> I learned to say this now from uh, Robert Bringhurst. It was a Canadian ethnographer and poet. And with his background in oral uh, storytelling, myth-telling, poetry, poetry becomes, it doesn't matter that it doesn't have that surface stuff, the lines and the, uh, the meters and the uh, obvious length of lines and everything. So because all the rest is there, all the use of image, the use of, of uh, music as part of it, and the movement toward enchantment, which is what poetry is about as well. Uh, I consider even though most of this is in what you would call prose, and some small pieces of it are more what you would call poems, and I'll read a few of those too, but it's all the same stuff. Um, the structure of the book, I want to say just a word or two about. Um, I want to show you the table of contents, which I had a lot of fun putting together. This is the table of contents. <laughs> it's, it's a great wheel, okay? And so I'm calling the, the segments of the book, not chapters, but uh, what are we calling spokes? Yes, <laughs> there's the word. Um, so each segment is a spoke and bears the weight of the whole thing while it's in place, and then you move on to the next, and the weight bearing keeps passing around to each of the spokes as you go. And that is what I consider the, the inner structure of the thing. Uh, each one of these spokes um, will have, almost all of them, a Heraclitus quotation, one of his uh, fragments, as they're called. And um, then some of them also will have a poem of mine, a small, a briefish thing. I'll read a couple of those. Um, oh, the other piece about the uh, spokes is that then there is a center, and the center is omega. The center is omega, that which is beginning and end, okay, and um, it's the thing that the whole thing turns around. And the introduction to this book is called Omega, For and After Word. Uh, as a sailor, I had to get for and aft separate from for and afterward there. But anyway, it's a, it's a word that could appear at the beginning or the end of the book. And then at the end of the book is another piece of Omega, which I will read at the end of, not right now. Uh, but 
but it, it also is called omega. So at the beginning and the end, you see omega, and then all the spokes of the segments in between. I'm, I've written out a condensed version for myself of the first half, and then I've skipped a bunch uh, on subjects such as the law, uh, sailing, uh, lovers, things like that. So you're going to get the first half condensed, and then you're going to get the ending, which is on poetry. So this is the fore and afterward. This world I was born into, our Western philosophy since the classical Greeks, our monotheistic religion, our science growing out of these two, our capitalism as well. They have left me with a world in which the names are bolted tight to it, as if the world were a car lot and the names are fixed firmly. What you see is what you buy, not a bit more, except maybe the feeling of having been taken. Words have been in place for a long time and are likely to remain so for a long time yet. The way words sound and mean changes with the speed of glaciers. They don't just vanish to be replaced by others that fill the space a little differently. In fact, often enough, changing the word doesn't change at all what lies beneath it holding it. The force is the force of a people, of generations, of the language itself. And how do you change that, or undo and do up another? Language is deeply living, deeply fluid, and deeply conservative and immovable, and is the property of no one. Today there are some 7,000 languages in the world. About 20 languages dominate the world. Many people are forced to be at least bilingual to maintain their native language. At the current rate, a language dies in our world about every four months. I am seeking the impossible to return myself in my relation to my language to a local, oral, familial, ecological heart. I have named myself for some years what I do unnaming. Unnaming is about tossing out, isn't about tossing out the names and starting over, not possible. Unnaming is as ugly and baggily shapeless a word as the unconscious. We need it in the same way, for the time. As unconscious points us away from our waking day world to the night world, a shapeless, fashionable dream that lies beneath, unnaming points us into the inner world of words fluid, powerful world to rise from. A word is a form of dream. The life in it swells and moves, dances and sings as its meaning moves among other words, carrying the life of meaning in the speaker. This is a process very important to me. It's the undoing of this so important rigidity of language. It's my work and my play. My game of solitaire, take it apart, scatter the pieces about, pick up the words, fan them, toss them in the air, sweep them across the table, watch all this, something will come of it. I go home to my room, close my door, gather the night and solitude, listen for the unsaying, the unnamed. This is where it begins. My heart is a cauldron, a centrifuge turning on its axis, an unmanageable finding its own way. Words stir and rise and fling themselves together, dizzying, compounding, a weavery, a tangle, a trap, a Gordian knot, the only way on. A poem, a made thing that never was before, left in a drawer or a box or an attic to be found again, breathed anew, alone. Return the bold and feral life to language that belongs to it. You may find this in the work of the poets who have meant most to me. A small list, but more, of course. Emily Dickinson, Wallace Stevens, Paul Salon, Lucy Brock Broido. Slip down into the sea of sleep, open your eyes, Watch them surround you, gliding to and away, watching alive the fish. Opas, schools of minnows, jellyfish, pricklebacks, rockfish, lampreys, dogfish, flounders, crabs. They appear, they disappear, each with its own life. Words hold it all. That is the proper naming. Lovingly, powerfully, musically, tenderly, words hold it. They and their circuiting are the brood the brooding, they hold the life that matters. Uncertain each moment we bring a name, the theater of it, the glory and squalor. And beyond, and for as endlessly far as we can imagine, nothing, zero, what we learn to call the void. A fertile emptiness. Here is good, here is everything. Live with patience and uncertainty. So now to chapter one, or excuse me, spoke one. The Great Wheel Turns, the introduction. One, the one and only, 
who's number one, we're number one. Hard to grasp the thought of a great age, an eon, the thought of its ending, the eon of a monocentric worldview, a worldview spawned over centuries by a religion believing itself universal. We have inherited a worldview governed by the principles of a unitary truth, product of undeniable reason from which has grown the laws of science, kept in order by one justice, organized as one nation under one God. A world turning into a single devouring vortex of violence and wars, Armageddon, apocalypse now. What are we to think of the one mind in which this unitary thought has its origin and resonance? An angry God, jealous of the betrayal of his people? A God withdrawn from turmoil and clamor into a meditative void? Or a self-system, each of us a little God? This is not far from the good, healthy ego of Freud's psychological system. Power loves itself, wishes itself larger, grander. It begins in the family and swells and multiplies and extends its reach. Capital and politics, this is the ego's dream. Each to become more and most become the one. Our world idea, Goya gave us the image, an old man, Saturn, father of gods, hideous and withered in body, gape-mouthed, gluttonous, who eats his son as his self-expression, the old devouring his death, his heritage, as he slowly dies of starvation. Freud wanted an ego ruling a mind broken into three, the magistrate, the worker bee, and the loony. Freud wanted to drain the swamp, round up the feral gypsy, give him an education in the one thing, dress him up, normalize him. Wo es war, soll ich werden, he said. All worker bees with cigar and cocaine habit like Freud. Freud got so busy being sure of the one thing, he missed the loony. He saw the images and the little bits of theater, but he missed the maker, the one who's been around for a long time, for longer than time. You can know it by its signs, but you won't catch it, what Freud named Das S. It's invisible, a force field, the way magnetism is, or a dark matter or a collapsing star. It drives the dream work. It's a thinker of a different thought, elusive, evasive, tricky. Shall I speak of? Duplicity. Yes, it's not single, it's skitzy, and won't give it up anytime soon. It's restless, solitary sometimes, crowdy sometimes, nomadic always, near mad, never the one. And besides, have you noticed, ours is not the only one. What do you do when there are two ones, and they're at war? One, eye to eye in a mirror, he's sure he governs the world. Twins bound together in eternal hatred. Enemies to the death, only one may survive, having absorbed the other the death of the world, or the way of the world, divided, driven. Uh, I've flip-flopped a couple of uh, chapters here. I want to do two next. So two, the schism, and it begins with a, uh, that, this is that break that I was just talking about. It begins with a Heraclitus line. War is the father of all things. Skitsy, yes, divided in ourselves right from the earliest and given to patching it over to bad conscience, self-righteousness, denial. The first moment you ever knew what you should do, you also knew the lure of what you shouldn't do. You will never escape it. You may embrace, take delight in the other in you, always watching, knowing you at every turn better than you know yourself, catching you out, smiling, saying, yes, I know, no matter what you do, how you turn. Two is the number of indecision, ambiguity, ambidexterity, duplicity, hypocrisy, double dealing, two-facedness, counterfeiting, bigamy. Two is the number of freedom and the unexpected. Two is the number of crossroads. Two gives us the beginning of language, the one listening all and expecting, and the voice you suddenly understand whispering in your ear. And so it is the number of the stranger, the guest arriving at the door, the door which has two sides. The next spoke now, and if not one, zero, okay? Zero and one, the female and the male in the Kabbalah, equals, as I imagine. One is the first of all numbers, activity, division, the generator of multiplicity of space. One is primacy, magistry, unity, consciousness, measure. Our entire Western tradition of thought, including our Western traditions of religion, founds itself on this one. And zero, zero the female, null, nothing, emptiness. Think Freud and the castration complex. Zero 
resists evolution and series. Its order is other. It is not the oppositional relation to one. You cannot apply Hegelian logic to it. There is a deeply enigmatic sense in which zero and one each rests on, is founded on the other, like lovers. And there will be more about zero in a little bit when I come to the spoke uh, on Cora. So now I go through a, a sequence of exploring the mind uh, on sleep, forgetting, memory, dream, uh, random access memory, that is, uh, and then conscious mind, and then the, the deep mind, the, the, just the deep mind, call it that. Um, so sleep first, and again Heraclitus to begin. All we see awake is Thanatos, which is the god death. All asleep, Hypnos, which is sleep. And then another one, sleepers are toilers and conspirators in making this world. Sleep, the living silence and darkness of a living mind. Sleep is not every phenomenon to waking, proof of the body's weakness and neediness. Sleep is the beginning. Without sleep, no waking. Dream wafts the intelligence of sleep. Sleep is zero, the threshold, no before. Sleep in its silence, in its irresponsibility, is its own intelligence. What is the substance of sleep, and where does it reside? Sleep like death is not within the borders of substance. Sleep is nowhere, wherever I am blind and deaf. Sleep, the eternal sea on which I ride out the night. Who steers through sleep? In its buoyancy, dreams breach and die. Sleep also underwashes waking. We can't speak of sleep as a foundation, nor that sleep itself rests on anything. It is nothing and fluid, and so we can no more speak of a solid foundation to waking. There cannot exist a logic of sleep. There are no fixed parts to be in relation or proportion. Sleep with all that sleeps hides of gods and demons and dreams. Sleep through which das es coils. All illusions, of course. The unborn too and the dead. Sleep was before we any began, and to sleep we finally return. And then forgetting. The Greek for forgetfulness is lethe name of the river of forgetfulness in Hades, the place of death. Lethe, river of Hades, lord of death. Lethe, the one, the lost before it's remembered. Forgetting has no descent, it is first. And I have to add in here, Lethe is forgetfulness. The Greek word for truth is adithia, not forgetting, okay? How's that for how a word comes into being? What is it to forget? What is so hidden as to be unsearchable? What is it to forget you have forgotten? Because we do. What meaning of forgetfulness is this? If Lethe is the place of shades, then that is to say the space of dream as well. We are born and then live for roughly five years before we begin, before we gain memory as recall. What is it to forget childhood, to have forgotten childhood, to forget time, to lose track of time and its passing? Whole days passed in such absorption and experience as if time had not yet begun to exist. These are miracle hours, and the memory of them, when it comes, the most intense. Is this what childhood was? Rapture? And what is it to have forgotten what you have no name for? You can use words to come near, you can circle, you can feel the currents floating about. You can feel the grief for its absence. That is a forgottenness to get near to, deep, disquieting wilderness, a desert, but near to the salt marshal of joy. We have come to the margin of walkabout of the dream time. And what does dreaming have to do with forgetting, with a forgetting that is not occasional, occasional and temporary? Forget, remember. And now we move on to this, uh, uh, the, the memory that we live our daily lives by, the, the uh, random access memory, the act, you know, that I want to remember this as well. And, um, but Heraclitus begins by saying, try, you will not reach the limits of the psyche, not by any track you might follow, mind is that deep. That memory of childhood is enchantment, remember that. What we are schooled in is accessible memory, what modernly we call random access memory, a willed act of recall developed like building muscle by repetitive action. 
A certain activity of our minds grows bulky exactly so, memory subject to recall. But recallable memory is stripped memory, isolated pieces, simplified, abstracted, tagged, neutered. And from this recallable memory, we construct our occupational and social lives, which become themselves accessible. We call what we remember in this way knowledge, as if to warehouse there all that memory might contain that is of worth to us. A child past remains. You have to learn learning all over, a learning not at all like gaining knowledge. How to be still enough, unknowing enough, surprisable enough, credulous enough. You must be able to give over that so hard one will and intentionality. And then what was forgotten, they begin to let itself be remembered. So there's a deeper, vaster memory on which even the earliest conscious memories float and sip. In these depths, there is no stepping apart, no objective view. There is not yet division of mind and body. Fiction, poetry, painting, drama, music are all arts of memory, and they are all forms of enchantment. Song, another word to circle, a little magic at work, a little enchantment. We want to enchant and be enchanted. That is a part of the theme of Eros. Song doesn't have to be melody, large voice, all the trappings. The voice knows its own rhythm. The vision, the rhythms enchant. This too is an intelligence. Memory is a river and a rhythm. We are all full of secrets if we listen. We are all full of seeds and currents. Memory takes on a life of its own, which we call irresponsible. It will surge, das S will flood through it. It will drive up dreams. It is a kernel buried, hulled in its coffin, Seeds live, burst, virgin. This is memory responsible only to itself. The unconscious is the name Freud gave to dream mind. Un carries all the discounting he intended. Consciousness is all those powers of mind that brought European civilization and science. Un leaves us in the dark with only the dream itself. The slum he believed needed cleaning up. Desire, Eros, was the risk civilization sought and still seeks to avoid of the pleasure principle, resistance, inhibition. It is an illusionist's mind, full of the tricks of evasion, ambiguity, substitution, doubling. It does not wish to be caught, bound, unstrung, dismembered, simplified. It is near to death in Hades. It flows beside death. You will find terror, but not death in dream. Dream does not wish death. Dream veils death. Dream arrows. Dream is one name by which to resummon this tricky, fluid, seductive mind, along with its mother sleep. A dream is visual hieroglyphic. It is opened by an eye for an eye. Dream opens as a space. I am lured into an enchanted scene. The tug, the current, is desire, consented to or resisted with all the attendant coloring of excitement, fear, frustration, grief, embarrassment, anger. There is absolutely nothing natural about a dream. There is very little that is natural about us men and women. From the unchartable moment when self-consciousness began, when we could look at our own thoughts, we became creatures of artifice and language. But how locate the artificer, the generator of dream? So many bad answers to that question down the centuries. Anybody can read, can interpret a dream for better or worse, but who can make one or unlock the secret of the making? Each of you receives the dreams made for you, the marks, otherness leaves in you without ever ceasing to be other and unknowable. And now this woman, or call her, call her a woman, uh, she isn't really, uh, she's in um, <coughs> Plato's Timaeus. Cora, Cora, scarcely a name, indicating a space, a region, a territory, nurse of gen generation, the epithet Plato gives to her in the Timaeus. She is death the old woman, maybe, or she is birth. They're that close. Honor to Cora, honor to this for centuries forgotten one. What surprise that she has gone forgotten. There is nothing to remember, no feature, no trait, no attitude, no train, no temple, no oracle. She is nothing but patience and receiving. Hard even to think of her, though without her there would be no thought, no perception, no word. She is marked upon without ever keeping on herself the least scar. She is inward, intimate, for each and in each. She is as vast as the cosmos she can contain. To begin to recognize her again, we have to leave Christianity sanitizing, <laughs> sanitizing, 
satanizing people. We have to begin a little clear of realism and scientism. So we point at her. She underlies the power of mind, is receptacle to it. We cannot call her dream. Dream has form and shape and distinction. Dreamlike thought reminds us of the perceived real. Dream, as well as the procession of waking imagery, takes shape, loom, and fade in her substance's substance. Cora is not matter. Plato was clear about that. And so not caught in the old oppositions of mind, matter, spirit, matter, or matter lay degraded. Cora is nothing, zero passive, impassive, and yet without her, without, without, that stammer of negation again, always before, there will be nothing to hold. To background thought, to be the space of dream and thought, to be the matrix of all writing from the beginning. She is as ancient as the thought of being human. She was always there, always available, neither encouraging nor criticizing nor altering, able moment by moment to hold the illusion of substance against Again, it's insubstantial the next. And yet I have to understand she is, she does the same for you and for anyone at any time. She does not choose nor select, but I can't show you the mark I make and leave in her. I can't lead you there. Only language feigning almost makes it seem it can reach from Cora and me to Cora and you. The enigma of the one many unresolvable. The one as the unique. Think carefully about that. Each of us is that one, but that's not what selfhood is about. The experience belies the thought, I am one, but not the one. How lonely, how with honor, how she bears up and opens like the sea, this ancient flora. Then the deep mind, mind the unexpected, trackless and unexplored. There is a waking mind kin to dream mind, daimon, Heraclitus called it. That old word from Plato and before, its right sense lost as it became a Christian thought, demon. Diamond, this is the earlier. Diamond is the human agency of cosmic intelligence. It resides in the shadows of us, each and every. It rivers through waking mind and language. If we can learn to listen, it is the river Heraclitus tells us we can never step in twice. Diamond running through the stream of Eros moves always forward, sometimes in flood, sometimes in eddy our source of awareness. It is always in motion, even in sleep, even in death. It is already present at birth. In memory, it is memory we wait years for, not mind. Ethos anthropoidamum, Heraclitus wrote, a person, anthropoi, at the center, a single psyche, that's the center of that statement, the ethos anthropoidamum, driven from within by this powerful intelligence, daimon, one side, surrounded and controlled by the collective human world, the communal mind, ethos, the mind we are socialized and schooled into. So we have these, these two things going, all of us, in us all the time, our socialized mind and our inner deep mind. As we waken and grow, scarcely noticing, ethos uses the great force language to bind us, language of potential glory, which turns out an actual narrowing of waking life. Language should release us to sing, to enchant ourselves into greater being. In fact, we turn it back on ourselves to reduce ourselves to manageable citizens. Language properly understood. Logos, the word of Heraclitus. Words are a bringing together, tying, binding, loosing of the phenomenal universe. Not a once and for all embedding as an Aristotelian logic. Words sway in the wind of each other, into the moment of use, and are nonetheless tough. So we each have more than one mind the schooled mind, and the diamond. It is easy as we think, using our words, to confuse the voice of ethos and diamond. And that waking mind, kin to dream mind, diamond, the modern public world tends to set aside as fancy and reality. It only works through the most deeply personal mind. It is utterly impersonal. These taken together, it manifests itself as a deeply personal, enormously broad intelligence. It does not self-manifest itself. Perhaps it can't. So there is no one, and therefore no personhood, to address. Each of us is its conduit, its instrument, no cause for pride. That anyone owns it is illusion. We must be ready not to be in control. That is an ultimate condition. OK, now we move on to the, uh, the part.
couple more pages that's about uh, poetry, basically. The Italian poet Patricia Cavalli has written a book entitled, My Poems Will Not Change the World. Poetry is not political, does not seek to change reality. Poetry is from the Greek poetis, maker. Poetry is personal, it makes of words a world of its own, alongside real time and space. The voice the poet listens to is the voice of the Dhamma. Plato taught us not to trust the poets who put aside the great one for their idiosyncratic sayings. We have been speaking and writing for a long time, forever even. Remember, language begins in us each as a division. We hear, we speak, other and self. At first, when we are young, language, because of its age and stability, takes on the appearance of reality. But language is not real. Reality, only a special collective insistence. That is what schools and libraries are about. But language also plays, it puns, it lies, it gives itself to secrets, it is fractile and flexible. Language has spun itself out of the idiom of dream, dream which is singular and self-rooted and would vanish from memory without language. Poetry begins with reading, with the force of desire, with wanting to be enchanted. Poetry is an odd sort of conversation, I should say listening as well as uh, writing, but we're talking about written poetry here. Poetry is an odd sort of con conversation. In reading, there is surrender, and the surrender is willing. It is surrender to the force, the enchantment of something written in another time perhaps yesterday, perhaps years ago. There is an enigma of time here. The writer is always absent from you, the reader. We are now bringing your souls to the words. Words the writer left on the page more or less long ago. Read from the page, half heard, they remain from another time. A meeting, an impossible confluence of times. There is no talking back to a poem, only surrendering to it and absorbing it. A poem speaks to us each, one at a time. We each may speak on another poem to be read alone, who knows by whom. Poetry does and doesn't exist in time and space. It belongs to zero, to Pora, memory outside of time. Time and the passage of life, birth and death are real. A poem is unreal. It is an aura, a presence, always ready to rise again into life. And uh, that poem of mine that's in the, in the text. The 700-year-old cedar grows, grows from the fallen body of a 1,000-year-old cedar. In the deep gravures of its bark grow whole evolved populations of ants and wasps and worms. A coffin is a closed thing. It says something has finished. Drive the nail home. Francis Bacon said, sometimes a man's shadow is more in the room than he is, and painted it. Emily Dickinson put away her poems in a box. It was only a year ago I found in a new book 1,500-year-old poems of Vidya. There are never-dying things lying sheathed like tempered blades in rare silk in a lightless drawer. I am myself a weatherman, a seaman. I watch the myriad of small things on the water in the wind. I listen for the small voices whispering. These and the awareness of desire are what matter. Awareness of desire, Eros, the great river of desire, drives through all things. Lovers know this, swim like dolphins in the flood. What concern do they have with intention and order? Joy and grief slash across these at an erratic angle. I've begun with the more obvious blazon of joy, the great physical streaming in the blood and nerves, but that's only the beginning. Joy is vaster, quieter, slower, richer, only it is invisible. Only you keep awareness of its presence and course. The best are surprises, Surprises make me a child again, both the fear and the delight. I'm learning to make surprise out of the ordinary, the chancy. I began here saying poems will not change the world. As you listen to what I've just written, you will realize this isn't entirely true. The poet uses language to transform his own world. We, any of us, find ourselves caught along ponderous medusa petrified time and reality, years of maybe, turned to the stone of cities and calendars and monuments, caught in all the conservative, slowness, sameness, repetition of it all. And then I hear Rilke's voice again saying, Voledivandro, want transformation, transformation. It is language makes transformation happy. It is within its great power to say the transformation of reality. A mere figure of speech, metonymy, can change the world. Metamorphosis, transformation, revolution, this for that, till it catch flame. 
True revolution is a flower, sudden, brilliant, wasted. Each man or woman is a flower, is an explosion across a night sky, is sudden loss found all over again. Culture, government, principle, work, cooperation. Families and schools and institutions keep a grip on these, grip the operative word, holding off revolution, holding off transformation. But diamond, the orchid, testicular flower sprung from the tree's crown, neither entirely natural nor artificial, a dream, dreams, delirium, fever, the turning over of revolution. You hear the metonymy running through all this. Revolution, transformation is in the writing. Writing is where the change has its life. Listen, the words and their elements come full of everything they are, earth, wind, fire, water, rage, grief, love, weariness, ease, in all their stories. The stories are theirs, the words, not ours. Treat them well, love them, their art. Read, forget, forget me, read more, wider, learn some languages, forget, listen, dream, write, go to sea, go to zero, love, dream some more, write some more, from no one, for no one. And then Heraclitus again, eon, which is the, the vastness of time, the ancientness of time, eon, a child playing at the dice, the child is not use that for a child. The last page then is that omega page that I told you about with the zero twisted to become the infinity sign, okay? One twist of zero, infinity, the Mobius strip, at the last, or is it the first? Infinity, the unending, the recurring, follow it all the way home, Noon on the sundial, no man at zenith, no shadow, no mark of time. Time passes, yes, and time returns. This is the moment in motion without movement, without memory or anticipation. Of course I was born. Of course I will die. And still there is forever this moment inside, outside time. The solar analemma, a sun year, the twisted course of the tilted earth, a figure eight in time. At home, forever on the way. All right.